Welcome to the Chicago Money Show. We help you bring more meaning, more money, and more happiness into your life. I'm Bridget Sullivan Rommel, and I've got a family financial planning practice in Chicago. I first found out, again, about George Kinder when I was thinking about entering the field of financial planning. And when I read his book, The Seven Stages of Money Maturity, a light bulb went on. He focuses on what is money teaching me at this phase of my life? What am I supposed to be learning here? And that's exactly what I want to, to talk about with George today. George, welcome. Yeah, great to be here, Bridget. Great. So nice to uh, sometimes when I talk about money, meaning, and happiness, I know that people are thinking that's just for other people. That's for rich people, or that's for people who are just artists, or that's for somebody else besides me. How do you respond to people about that topic? Well, I think it's the most important thing in life, not to mention the most important thing in money. And it's really what money is meant to deliver is uh, is meaning and happiness, different words for that, uh, to, to deliver us into what makes us most vital and most extraordinary as human beings. So it's something that uh, we really want to start with when we're young, you know, just when we're beginning to enter the world, we want to have that vitality because if you wait until you're retired, you've just taken decades and probably put a bit of a damper on who you're really meant to be. Yeah. So can you give me an example, for instance, how has it worked for you? Well, when I, if I go back to my early days, I, uh, I knew pretty early on that I didn't want to work in the field of money, mm -hmm. uh, which is a funny thing because here I am and I've, I've been doing this for a long time, but I, but I've never, I, I've always done both. So what I really wanted to do was I wanted to be an artist of some sort. I wanted to have a deep life. Uh, so I do a lot of mindfulness, for instance. But in the early days, what I realized was that money was the ticket in a way. If I worked hard and but kept my focus on not just the money, but on who I really felt like I was meant to be, that I could have both. And so the earning of the money in the early days, I got a tax practice. I went to graduate school uh, in, in accounting and won the bronze medal on the CPA exam. So I did a lot of things. I knew if I did them really well, that it would help set up my ability uh, to be free. But I never, I never abandoned the dream. And in fact, I kept it alive almost daily. I, I clearly there was a year or two where I was, you know, doing overtime, but um, uh, important to keep both alive. Yeah. You know, I started out with a tax practice as well, and I was surprised how many CPAs had uh, rich artistic lives. It's actually kind of surprising, especially when you look at CPAs who have their own small practices. A lot of people are attracted to the field just because it, it can give you, if you at least in your mind, it can give you time to uh, pursue other interests. So tell me about the topic of money and happiness, particularly. What about money makes you feel happy? Well, right now, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm not really retired. I'm 75, but I, you know, I'll probably be going forever with what I do. But I, right now, I think the thing that makes me most happy at this age and at this stage of my life is spending the money that I've accumulated, earned, saved, and invested, spending that money on things that are really part of um, uh, what I'm most passionate about in life. So, but that's a late stage. I mean, I, I think that's always been with me, but I've been able to accumulate more of that as I go along. In the early stage, when I uh, was just beginning, I took enormous pleasure in earning the money, so working uh, for money, and then secondly, saving it. It was just an astonishing thing to realize that I could accumulate money over time, even though I was working, you know, for very little, like nine dollars an hour was what I started at, and uh, uh, but I would save even from that, and then to learn about investing in a way that is not just kind of throwing your money at the horses, but actually you know, doing it in a sensible way and then seeing it steadily over time uh, increase. And then, but then also knowing that this money is meant for a purpose yeah. and it's meant to 
and freedom and happiness. Yeah, it, yeah, it's very interesting. And I think, like, getting back to when people start out, I think that uh, sometimes money can be very personal to you, but then in another way, it can seem like a board game. And so it's like winning or losing a board game doesn't say that much about you personally. Maybe whether or not you figured out the rules of this board game more than um, anything else. Um, so what about, I, I thought your viewers, in that vein, I thought your viewer, the viewers would be really interested to hear about your paper route. <laughs> All right, well, well, um, you know, the truth is that I was always good at games. Not everybody is. But the, the passion uh, uh, that money delivers to us to actually be able to use it for who, who we really want to be uh, should make all of us you know, clever enough to do well in that game. And, and so when I was a, a boy, my, my brother Peter Kinder, who's well known in the ESG and socially responsible investing movement and all, all of that, he ran the paper route. Um, but he had trouble collecting, you know, getting the money from the customers because his heart uh, still is. His heart was so engaged with everybody that he met. Um, and I came along and I was just really, really clever. And uh, and so my parents were concerned, you know, how are we going to we want to make money here? And I said, OK, you know. What, look, I'll collect uh, three days, three days a month, and you can deliver the other twenty-seven days, and we'll split the profits. And he was gay, and uh, and so I, I loved collecting. I loved. Uh, I had a pouch that I stuffed the money in. <laughs> those coin machines that I put it in. It was a thrill, and, and but at the same time, I was learning the lessons that he was learning as well. I grew up in a very poor part of the country, mm -hmm. and I didn't have nearly the heart early on that he had. But I saw that people struggled to get the money to pay for the for the paper, and that touched me deeply. The mm -hmm. connections with people touched me, so I was learning all all along. Yeah. but it was. It was a game as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, and you kind of can go, okay, good cop, bad cop. It is hard. And like you can have different people doing different functions. It's like a little small business. It's a, it's a very interesting story. Okay. So at, um, after that start, you went on to become an early practitioner and really a pioneer in financial planning. And you've developed three questions that are sort of your uh, trademark claim to fame. And uh, we still use them in the industry. So let's talk about the first question, your first kinder question, and why it's important. Yeah. So the first question is if you had all the money that you needed uh, for the rest of your life, maybe you're not as rich as the, the, the uh, now the king of England. It used to be the queen of England or, or uh, J.K. Rowling. You're, you're, but you're, you're, you're really, you know, you're well enough off to live the rest of your life. What would you do with your, with your life? And the purpose of the question is to loosen us up. And to realize that money can provide a lot of things that would be a lot of fun for us. So it's almost like you're winning the lottery. Um, but it, I usually tailor it to what you need. So it's not like you are as rich as these very rich people out there, the billionaires necessarily. But you got everything you need. What would it look like? And mm -hmm. what an, you know, that's an exciting thing for us to engage with and play with. And one of the reasons that it's really important is that it sets up the next two questions. Yeah, well, I think it's important, too, because sometimes people start with what are my circumstances, not what are all the possibilities. And so that, that question, I, I like it because it gets us to be thinking about what are all the possibilities out there and, and not just focused on what is my, because we can all uh, have tunnel vision, especially when we're dealing with scarcity. Like if we grew up in a place with scarcity, it makes you just think about what's the next thing. And so, and maybe approaching the things that are out there with, oh, I'm kind of jealous of the Queen of England, or, you know, like, instead of like, well, wouldn't that be great if I got, uh, how to, the Queen of England isn't that great of an example because it's uh, a red, you know, it's passed down through hereditary, but, but other people that have made it on their own, it's like, if that's really your goal, you can pursue it. Right, right. Um, yeah, the, I mean, yeah, you're right, right on. Yeah, great. Yeah. So we're going to take a short break here. Stay tuned for the next half of Chicago Money Show with our Jeff, our guest, George Kinder. <laughs> 
Do you want to know what makes Chicago great at eight? Team Chicago Challenge. For more than 37 years, Team Chicago Challenge gives you very cool information about all things motorcycles that you've been very hard pressed to find anywhere else. So tune in to Can TV Channel 19 this week and every week at 9 o'clock p.m. for Team Chicago Challenge for more amazing, unique, and homegrown Chicago programs. Welcome back. We're here with George Kinder. So George, you just before the break, you talked about your first of your questions that you uh, work with clients be with. So let's talk about your second question. So the, the, the second question goes deeper and it asks if you were, were to go to the doctor, you're assuming everything's fine uh, uh, and the doctor surprises you with the news that you only have five to 10 years left to live. Uh, you'll live at least five, but you won't make it to that 10th year. And the question is, what would shift for you? What would change? What would you do with your life? And that's an extraordinary thing, of course, and we're, we're, we're shortening the time that we have left. And so the focus for all of us becomes, what am I meant to do? What do I really want to do? What do I want to experience? Who do I want to be? And uh, so it gets deeper, gets more toward relationship, more toward legacy issues. And again, it sets up the third question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love this question because, again, it helps focus people on what's uh, most important to them in a very efficient way, you know, because it helps us strip away all the things that are uh, superfluous. Have you yeah, gotten interesting responses to this at all from, uh, from, I'm wondering when you ask people this question, if anybody's responses have surprised you? Well, I think um, the, the second question, not so much the, uh, the, a surprise, uh, but what, what did happen kind of universally were, were people gravitated toward relationships. And I suppose another thing that happened a lot because you get five to 10 years, the bucket list, you know, yeah. and, and travel is, is a major part of that. So there's a lot of travel in there as well. Um, but what's wonderful about these questions is that they're so idiosyncratic. They're mm -hmm. so connected to each of us individually revealing uh, who it is that we want to be. Right. So let's talk about the third question. Uh, why don't you tell me about that? All right. So the third question, you go to the doctor again, you know, same setup, uh, but this, the answer is different. This time the doctor really shocks you with the, uh, the knowledge that you've got. He, he says, I, I've misdiagnosed. You have a rare ailment and um, you only have 24 hours left to live. Mm. So the question is not, what would you do with that time? The question is reflecting on who you thought you would be and what you thought you would do. What, did, what have you missed? What will you miss? Who will you not get to be? What will you not get to do? And here the, um, it, 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 it's such a life and death question. You know, we don't even have those five or 10 years left. So we're looking at what is the most profound thing, the most meaningful thing, the most, the thing that brings the most happiness and most meaning into my life. What are those things that I've not yet delivered uh, that I will, that, that I've missed out on? So it's, it, th this question really is the focus of the, uh, the life planning community that I've trained now for uh, a couple dozen years. Uh, uh, all over the world, because it is the most meaningful question. It's not that we don't use the other goal exercises that are there on the other questions, but this one gets to the heart of it. These are things we have to deliver into our life. And, and one of the reasons that I say, you know, if you're in your 20s, you ought to be focused on this now. Uh, and so that all of your life is, is kind of funneling you into, bringing you into uh, the, the great world that you want to live in. Yeah, it's really an interesting concept, too, because it's you're using the emotion, our own emotions of regret, like and thinking, OK, 
I'm going to kind of evoke a little regret in myself and then try to work backwards. Like, okay, if this happened, what would I regret? Like, what would I regret not being, not, not doing, you know? And, um, I think that the, it's a, like, it's certainly an emotion that we don't want. There's been whole songs, you know, regret. I have a few, but then again, too few to mention, you know, and so this is kind of setting you up for that attitude <laughs> like that. Okay. I want my last 24 hours to be that, you know, <laughs> I don't, you know, uh, but it's interesting because usually we don't, it's really more about avoiding a negative emotion avoiding negative emotions, avoiding the, those feelings of regret, uh, by thinking ahead a little bit, by planning in that, in that way. Yeah, you know, the the responses are incredible here, and you, there are surprises here. Uh, usually a family and relationship plays a huge role, but not always. And um, and also changes. Uh, there are moments of uh, in people's lives where, uh, where we're in a transition, and suddenly things will change dramatically. But often the core of the third question remains, even over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it becomes something you can put in your refrigerator, put on your mirror and just go, I'm going there. That's where I'm headed. Yeah. Uh, and what we do in life planning is we make sure that that happens in relatively short order. That's mm -hmm. what makes this really exciting uh, to, to work with this kind of uh, emotion. Um, so I want to get into how people relate to the financial industry a little bit. So sometimes... Uh, people have felt burned by financial advisors or else they just, the whole notion of the financial institutions, banks, and like the Fed. The Fed? What is the Fed? And I hear they influence my life. Like, how do you suggest viewers work through uh, those, those feelings and uh, just that part of financial life? Yeah, well, I mean, gosh, uh, you know, there's a lot of mistakes that have been happening in the world, and we feel it. And and one of the problems with the the frame that you're putting uh, uh, on this, and that many people put on it, is you can have all kinds of conspiracy theories come in that have nothing to do with the reality of the situation. But there is a reality to banks lending money to fossil fuel companies, to the Mother Earth uh, uh, warming up and, and struggling into money and politics. And all of this is funded often by large institutions. So there's an element of truth to that, and that's worth paying attention to, but it's not nearly as important for each of us individually as each of us living into the life that we're meant to live. And for that, we need to work with financial people and financial ideas that are uh, sustainable, that are stable, that are uh, truthful, uh, scientific. And so the, the main thing here that I think of is it, it, in both worlds, whether you take the big world or you take this this world of who, who, do, who am I going to work with to be able to make my life sing like it's meant to sing, is the term fiduciary comes up. Um, frankly, I think that, that we need to change some laws to make sure that every corporation that exists, every nonprofit, every government is a fiduciary for the earth, for democracy, and for all people. Mm. But our initial you know, concern for ourselves is that is that we need a fiduciary to work with us to make sure that our life flourishes. And I think there are, you can quote me on this, I think there are three elements to a great fiduciary. And if you get only two of them, you're doing pretty good. Uh, and so I'd, I'd stick with that. But if you can get a third, it's just wonderful. So the those three elements that I'd look for, one of them is, is the person that you're working with charging on a fee only basis? Not a fee-based basis. Be very careful about that. Uh, are they charging on a fee-only basis? And you can look this up, and there are numerous organizations that that only uh, work from uh, work with advisors who are on a fee-only basis. So that's I think that's the most important thing. The second that is uh, that I think is probably the next two are kind of equal. And the second one that I think is really important is that the person be really trained in what I call life planning. I think they should be a registered life planner. And there are hundreds of them all over America and even more all over the world that will actually ask these questions of you and deliver you know the, the best technologies to deliver you into your dreams of freedom. 
So that would be the second thing. And the third thing is, are they a certified financial planner? Are they holistic in terms of their approach to finance? Do they Have they really studied finance in all of these different ways? If you can get two of those three, you're doing pretty good. If, you're doing, if you can do three of the three, you're in Valhalla. Uh, uh, really quite wonderful. You yeah. know what I found? I, you know, I totally agree with you on uh, a lot of what you're saying. I, you know, one of the things that I really want to pull out is I found it really interesting how you were talking about how corporations should be fiduciaries. And uh, now I was talking to a friend one at a time who was like, fiduciary, it sounds like something I don't want. It sounds like a disease I don't want. And I'm like, no, 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 you want a fiduciary. So let's go back and just talk about what does that term mean? Like in, yeah. in its essence, a fiduciary. Yeah. Well, a, a fiduciary is going to put people first. That's yeah. the main thing. I've even, I, I even have a fiduciary standard and I, you can find it in some of my books and some of my websites and things. And that fiduciary standard for corporations would be that they would put ahead of their own profit, they would put um, the planet, democracy, and all, all people, people that they engage with in any possible way. So they have to be fair in regard to that. So it means putting us first, making the world humane. And if you think about this incredible world that we're in that has produced so many things, we live so much longer than our ancestors and we can do so many more things. But the truth is after 250 years of, of kind of capital capitalism producing these incredible things, why is it that we don't find democracy everywhere? Why is it that we don't find the planet Earth really healthy? And the, frankly, the reason is that we allow institutions to exist that do not have the best interests of all of us as the main thing that they're focused on in addition to whatever product they're delivering to us. So fiduciary means putting us first. And we want we want that, you know, that's, right. that's, that's a great society. Then, gosh, what an incredible world we would have uh, coming out of this. You know? Okay, so let, we talk to a lot of people that are between the ages of 55 and 75, and they want to keep working, but the employers aren't really necessarily set up for that or they're struggling. They're, they're in kind of more of a struggle than a lot of other um, age groups. Uh, what do you? What advice do you offer to those people? Well, it, it's um, uh, there's several things. The uh, I've been an entrepreneur all my life, small time, independent, self-employed in a way. Gosh, it's a wonderful life. You have freedom. You can craft your day any way you want. Right. You can spend any number of days you want working, any number of days you want to do other things. You can do that. So if you've got a skill set. Um, I would be thinking in a couple of ways, if, if corporations aren't responding to you in the way that you would like, I would think about, is there a way to market this in a self-employed way? Is there a way that I can do this part-time? And I think the third thing is, you may want to do that, but have you thought about the third question? Have you thought about the second question? Yeah. What is it that you really want to do in your life? And then how does this work feed that and uh, and make that uh, make your life just thrive, flourish. That's what you really want. Great. So we've got about one one minute left to, for you to answer this one question. And that is, I'd like to ask all my uh, guests, what brings meaning to your life? Yeah, well, I got, a, I got an incredible family and that was a real surprise to me because it was not in my third question early on. But what was has continued and that is that I wanted to live a life that was rich in the arts. I'm a poet, I'm a photographer, I've written many books and rich uh, with a spiritual life and I've practiced mindfulness in a, in a profound way uh, on a daily basis for over 50 years. So those things just are incredible and engaging, you know, engaging with you, Bridget, and engaging with the world in Chicago now and being able to talk to people all over the world because I've done something that has meaning for them is fabulous, just incredible. I feel so lucky. Uh, George, I wanna thank you so much for being our guest today. Um, my name is Bridget Sullivan Mermau. I own a family financial planning practice here in Chicago. And you can find out more about my firm at sullivanmermau.com. And uh, you can check out this show's website at the Chicago Money Show. 
www.thinkingmindset.com. Sign up for our newsletter so that you get a heads up before future shows. And if you've got questions about this episode or for future episodes, please email us at chicagomoneyshow.com. Oh, wait, that was ask at chicagomoneyshow.com. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.